Hello, Oscillator Sync here. And uh, last weekend, like many other people who are interested in electronic music and electronic instruments, I made the pilgrimage to Berlin to go to Superbooth. It was my first year uh, that I've ever managed to make it, and I won't spend too much time waxing lyrical about you know what it was like, but I will say that uh, in terms of scope and scale and vibe, there's kind of nothing else uh, that I'm aware of or that I've been to that kind of matches it. It was a really nice uh, event, and if you have the means and the opportunity to go and you're into this kind of stuff, then I can highly recommend uh, checking it out. So I didn't really go with the intention of making a whole lot of content, certainly not any real in-depth demos or anything. You know, there are other channels that are doing that to a very high standard, and there's no real reason for me to try and compete there. But um, I did want to highlight some of the stuff that I saw there that I thought was particularly cool. Some of it I think other people would have talked about already because it's kind of the high profile stuff, but there's some stuff that I picked up on that I really, really liked that maybe hasn't been spoken about as much, and I wanted to highlight that to uh, viewers of the channel. One of the trends that appeared to be going on at Superbooth this year was a move towards um, a lot of electroacoustic or electromechanical devices, it's things which generated sound or influenced sound, not just by shunting electrons around, but actually interacting with the physical world. And I guess the place to start with that um, would be the Korg Berlin Phase 8, probably sort of coming into Superbooth, the thing that I was most excited to have a play with. and. Uh, yeah, it's a really, really interesting instrument. I had, um, I, got, I got in early uh, on day two to, to spend some time with it. And yeah, it, it sounds kind of like a cross between a electric piano, but then you know, it's got the built-in uh, drive and wave folding and the tremolo in there as well. And then being able to physically interact with the tines by muting them or placing other things on it was, was really, really interesting. But the thing that really sort of made me take notice was the big slider where you can open up the VCA for all of the tines at once and you can hear them sympathetically resonating. Um, that's a really, really cool sound, and I can't wait to run that through a ton of distortion, frankly, and delay and reverb, and I think that would be a very good time. Um, they told me that hopefully by um, next Super Booth they would have the product. That doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be released, but there will be an actual thing that will be the finished um, instrument. In that same vein, um, I also had a chance to play with the Leaf Audio um, sort of uh, contact mic boxes which are really nicely made um, boxes with different things to ping and scratch and bow uh, with contact mics inside uh, but they also were showing a um, magnetic contact mic which looked very smart and looked very robust but also this geophone which is a um, contact microphone that's sort of derived from the type of equipment they would use to measure seismic activity so super linear and extends well down into subsonic um, sound uh, and uh, while I was there the the guy in the tent there put it on the table and suddenly I could hear the whole of Super Booth all at once and it was like wow I, I think that would be such a great addition to anyone that's uh, looking at field recording uh, type stuff I probably would be picking one up myself I think one of the hidden gems over in uh, the Bungalow Dorf area, I think, was the Knass or Nass, I don't know whether you pronounce the K. Uh, th they make um, the Moisturizer Spring Reverb, and they were showing a prototype instrument which was based around a single string and a motor which, um, by very, very precisely bowing that string, could get the string to sing out in all of its harmonics, and then you could by adjusting the speed of that motor, playing the keyboard, pull out those harmonics from the string and play them in real time. Uh, it sounded really, really great, but um, they kind of admitted that it's still very much in the prototyping stage and there's lots and lots of variables to play with, some of which are fun to play with from a sound design perspective, but some of which make it difficult to calibrate so they were outside and the temperature fluctuations were affecting how effective it could be uh, and actually while I was stood there they were switching over different mutes and they found the material that was getting the best sound for a particular string so yeah it's potentially something which requires some nuance to work with um, hopefully a lot that we worked out during the prototyping stage but in terms of the sound and the ingenuity to make it do what it was doing again from the sort of electromechanical electroacoustic side of things um, I thought that was really, really interesting. And 
in many ways, you know, honestly more interesting than the Korg Berlin uh, device. It's just a little bit further behind on the on the sort of prototyping side, but that's one to look out for. I, I really hope it it's something that they can sort of build into a finished instrument because I thought it, it was really, really cool. Next to the Knas booth in the uh, Bungalow Dorf, uh, there was also the new Menki instrument, the one that looks like uh, Totoro, sort of, but with flashing lights and weird sliders and wooden knobs. Um, that also has an element of uh, using uh, a microphone and feedback to bring in sounds from the physical world that was quite interesting. I didn't have a lot of time to play with it because there was kind of a few people behind me and I don't like causing a, a cue just for the sake of messing around with an instrument. It completely baffled me while I was in there. It has some resonators, sort of pinged resonators as you would expect from Menki. Lots of stuff to do with feedback and there was some modulation going on in there. And as I say, the microphone in there, completely incomprehensible in the moment, but I left wanting to comprehend it. Um, so um, I don't know whether they've released the price for that yet, but that's definitely something that is on my list. So moving on to the sort of modular and submodular world, um, one of the first things I checked out while I was there was the um, Bifaco Oniori, not entirely sure on the pronunciation there. It's, uh, you may have seen it already, but it's kind of this bonkers sort of ambient set in a box, which introduces drones and looping and resampling and then uh, effects for resonators and reverbs um, and then it has a modulation section and randomness that you can sort of route directly without having to patch in in the actual instrument um, a really really interesting thing and kind of something a bit different from Bifaco to other stuff that they've released I think but it looks and sounds really really good and I think you could take that and put it in like a small pod case with maybe like some touch interface and maybe just a one or two extra modulation sources and that's like a whole ambient set um, you can even sample the room that you're in to start the loops so yeah it, it, it's really really good and, and definitely one to uh, watch Bastel was showing off um, two things mainly. Uh, the first is the crust module, which is another um, firmware for the pizza platform. So uh, crust is like a sort of drum percussion type thing. You might think of it like a digital DFAM kind of thing, but um, it, it's a bit more flexible than that in, in a lot of ways and obviously a, a lot smaller it sounds really really good they're still refining the firmware to make sure the sweet spots are a little bit wider on all of the controls and it's great that they're taking the time to do that but even in the state that it was in um, I, I thought it already sounded really really good I'm looking forward to get one of those in to try out but probably the bigger thing that they were showing uh, is the new time plus the sort of reissue revamp of the time delay looping module um I'm, i've got one of those on the way so i don't want to talk about it in too much detail but it's kind of um, the ultimate delay module if you want to modulate everything that's happening within your delay and loop it and play with the feedback it, it's a lot and it's one of my biggest regrets not getting one of them on the original run so i'm, I'm really happy that they've um, released a updated version. I had a really, really good chat with Ritual Electronics. Um, you might know them from their Guillotine uh, 1U distortion module, um, which is uh, really cool. Uh, but they were showing off a couple of different things. The main thing they were showing off was a really, really flexible matrix mixer, both for audio and for CV. This one had a couple of extra tweaks with it because it had additional outputs that you wouldn't usually have, which did combined rows uh, columns rather of the outputs and also some diagonal outputs as well and uh, while I was there um, they were showing some uh, harsh feedback noise patches my kind of bag uh, and when I think when they saw my uh, my face light up they then showed me some of the other prototypes they had there so they've got a, a cool VCA you can never have enough of them uh, dirty with a separate drive um, and usefully an attenuverter on the uh, CV input so that you can easily set it up to do ducking. That's that's always appreciated. A crazy four sine wave um, rolling FM oscillator where the first sine wave FM's the next one, FM's the next one, and then it loops back around. So you can use it for drones and crazy sounds. Uh, all analog, so not digital, so you know, 
it's not going to do sort of clean pitch tracking when you start to bring in too much FM, but it sounded kind of mad. Uh, some controls for spreading the sounds out as well. And then the one that was most interesting to me, uh, which again was just a prototype, but I really hope that they bring it out, is just a 1U PT233.9 based uh, delay. So that sort of gritty digital but kind of analog sounding um, chip that's used in a lot of devices that was derived from like karaoke machines. CV over time, they've got it set up so it goes really, really long and grungy. I think they said two seconds. And then there's a switch to basically circuit bend the delay and put it into harsh noise mode, uh, which I'm also, uh, I find that very welcome. Just down from Ritual, there were Jolin, who you might know they make a sort of chaotic swarm oscillator module, but they were showing off this instrument called Avalith, which was this 100 oscillator experimental drone synth. And it can do kind of wall of noise things. It's got uh, a clever sort of micro patching uh, matrix in there for you to add sort of um, performance into it by um, patching things via the buttons that are on the front panel. It's got a filter out on the end, sort of dirty resonant filter. And yeah, it can do like absolutely insane wall of noise kind of um, patches. But I also set it up uh, to sound like a bunch of toads that were uh, making love in a uh, lake which is appropriate for this year's super booth if you know then you know one thing i really liked in one of the tents was these vasky lights modules they're 2 hp stereo um sort of rgb uh, led monitoring modules so you can monitor like a vu meter you can monitor cv both uh, unipolar and bipolar uh, you can do spectrographs you can do waveforms uh, you can turn it into a tuner it's all in stereo and it's only 2 hp and they're very affordable and i think i'm probably going to get one to use in demos because um i think they're very very neat um and they seem to work very very well on the booth anyway I don't think either of these two modules are new, but on my last day, uh, I went straight to the bungalow door for one of the first places I went was to the AJH um, bungalow in there, and they had uh, one of their big systems set up. And I played with a module, let me just get the name right, called the uh, Entropic Doom, which is basically a sort of weird noise source paired with a resonant filter, but then also with a additional auxiliary input for other audio which you can then do ring modulation with um the whole noise into filter thing is just like absolutely my go-to trick when i'm building patches i love it um and this one sounded like really doomy and uh, and <laughs> just really really good and we were running uh on the auxiliary input we were taking uh, an output from their um wave animator swarm module running that in then it was just like instant sort of resonant-esque drones uh, and uh yeah it was a good way to start the day start the day with drones that's my uh, suggestion and that's how i started my my final day at super booth across the road from ajh there was a big bungalow and in there amongst some others Verona and Dopefer were in there as well, uh, was Flame Audio, and they had a bunch of, of their recent modules there. Uh, the one that I played with the most was their Fire module, which is their drum synthesizer module. Um, really, really flexible. I promised I wouldn't liken it to like the Electron idea of machines, but it's kind of what it is. Uh, you can load different machines onto the different channels, and they each have their own parameters, which makes it, you know, to say, really, really flexible. It sounded really, really good. Um, quite an interesting module you get a lot in not in a small space but you get a lot of value out of the space that you actually have the one thing is that it works a lot better if you are feeding it midi rather than triggers uh, you get more out of it that way uh, but they also i think have a module which goes from triggers to, to midi so you can still sort of bridge that gap in your system if you need to but yeah that, it sounded really really good and if you want a all-purpose drum module that's definitely one to check out also in that area um there was earwave and they had their swarm um it was the first time i had a play with the swarm and it was good i think a lot of people already know that the swarm is a good uh um, so modular synth uh, but they also had set up what the swarm was going into was one of their metallic resonator speakers and um it was the first time i'd actually heard one in person and actually stood in front of it and it was i don't know whether it was because i was tired because it was early in the morning but it was quite a visceral experience and i felt quite emotional hearing the way that 
it sort of shimmered and shattered the sound that was going into it. it really, really wonderful. Unfortunately, quite expensive, but probably worth it if it's your vibe um, way of amplifying uh, your sounds. I really, really liked it. And um, uh, it's sort of gone on the list of like, if I suddenly find myself with some money, that's, I probably will buy one. Along that same sort of vibe as with the Earwave, um, Nebula Instruments were showing a bunch of things in the uh, main foyer as you go in. There were some um, crystal phones, crystallophones, the ones that you rub to make the sound, the glass ones. Uh, but they also had some um, also sort of metallic speakers that were being driven by, I think it was just a, a Minilog XD. But again, having that sort of physical metal resonator there just made it sound amazing. Traditional polysynths aren't usually the thing that grabbed my attention, but like a lot of other people, a big standout of the show for me was the Supercritical Redshift 6, a DCO based polysynth with a huge amount of control over the components, but they've been really, really smart in that they haven't exposed all of that control all at once. Rather, you can put the oscillators and the filters into different modes, which expose different sets of parameters for doing different sorts of things. So the filters are a really good example. You've got like a blendable multi-mode filter, but you put it into a different mode and suddenly you get performance instead, or you put it into another mode and you get uh, all pass for doing analog phaser, which sounds amazing, incidentally, on this synth. There's another one where you've just got a, a bunch of different modes of, of um, notches and band passes, like a, a sort of um, set state filter. Um, and it just allows you to turn the architecture of the filter into a bunch of different possible polysynths. And that would all be by the by if it didn't sound good but it sounded really really good and they've got a very flexible uh, mod matrix in there lots of modulation it's one that i'm really excited to see how they progress and also the price point that they were talking about which i think was about 1200 euros for all of that and it being analog polysynth is actually kind of mad and if they can hit that price point i think they'll sell loads and loads of them uh, i'm really excited to see how that project sort of progresses I went to the Novation Sequential um, Oberheim room, uh, but it was really, really busy most of the time, so I didn't have much time to play with the new Oberheim. However, I did touch Novation's Great Big Knob, and that was a lot of fun. I had some time with the Moog Spectrovox. I've been looking for a desktop um, filter bank for a long time, and this is that, so I will probably get one. Inevitably, I sat there and I turned it into a drum machine and then I left. Sorry to whoever came up to it after I'd been playing with it. Speaking of uh, things that sound like drum machines, I was literally grabbed by um, Art from Mad Sound Factory uh, so that he could show me his new instrument called Drop, which he described as being a groove box. I'm not sure if that's exactly how I would describe it. It's kind of like if a DFAM uh, didn't give a fuck and also hated you, uh, but in <laughs> all of the right ways, it was one of the most instantly aggressive sounding synths that I heard for the entire um, event. And I, I love it and I want to play with it more. It doesn't have a conventional sequencer. It's all based around LFOs and clock dividers. Um, and it just sounds um, massive and angry. It's got feedback in it. It's got saturation. It's got saturation in like three different places. Um, incredibly aggressive sounding, incredibly cool. Yeah, and I, and, and I want to play with them. It does, however, have banana jacks, which means that I might finally be crossing that threshold into synths that use banana jacks. And there's kind of no coming back from that. I, I recognize that. I uh, had an opportunity to play with the Lep Luma series. There's a basically a whole ecosystem of sort of noisy drone synths with um, like um, light control and, and all sorts. And um, ultimately, if that's the kind of thing that you like, they sounded really good. They've sounded really aggressive. There's lots of stacked filtering if you use it with the uh, mixer from that ecosystem as well. Um, really characterful and they're not expensive. Um, I'm hoping to grab a couple of them to show on the channel because uh, yeah, that's something that I've kind of overlooked a little bit, but having hands-on experience with them now, I, I'm quite interested in them. But the Sima Former Alt, which is a, uh, a sort of drone-focused synth, uh, four voices, 
in stereo, so you can pan the individual voices, which I really, really like. Um, you've got filtering and um, some effects down there and some ways to modulate things, and you've got a really cool pin matrix, and I do love a pin matrix uh, for patching. I had uh, quite a long time with it. I managed to uh, get, get a good idea of what was going on there. Uh, it sounds really good in its basic format. One thing that I said to them um, on the stand, and I apparently wasn't the only person to say this, is that I kind of wanted it to to push a little bit further, like maybe have some feedback or cross modulation so that it didn't sound quite so polite the whole time, uh, which they seem to take on board and they're still in the sort of prototyping stage. So um, I think this Kickstarter goes live this week or next week. Um, and uh, for a interesting niche instrument, the price didn't sound too upsetting either. So that might be one that I'll, I'll look at backing. There was this recorder thing that is apparently a uh, recorder and also a MIDI control and possibly a synth, but there was no way I was going to put my mouth on a recorder that was just left out at a trade show. So I don't know whether it works, but I thought I'd mention it. I was able to get some hands on time with the Soma Flux, their sort of contactless magnet based instrument. So like an ultra theremin, lots of expression in every single direction so tilt and moving things towards and on both hands as well and um, I was surprised at how quickly I felt comfortable playing it um, and doing something that felt sort of meaningful musically it sounded really good like I say it felt really nice to play every little movement influenced the sound in a way that felt right it is also not as expensive as I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be, you know, thousands and thousands of, of, of pounds. So I think it's just going to be a grand, which does put it in that sort of danger zone for a um, experimental instrument that is also affordable if you are into that sort of thing. So that's just another thing that Soma make that I'm going to have to buy at some point. Uh, they also mentioned that uh, it hasn't got a whole lot of ways to control other instruments out of the box, but they are planning on having a breakout box, which gives you access to all of the different dimensions of expression uh, so that you can control other things with it, which, um, yeah, that'd be really, really cool. Another standout, I think, for a lot of people was the Wiggler V3. I saw this advertised a couple of months ago and I thought, maybe a bit gimmicky but having seen it in use by someone who can actually play it and having some actual hands on time as well it's a really nice way to interact with uh with a synth it makes it easy to play things that are meaningful and have lots of expression again like the the soma uh, flux in a way but uh, but very very different in lots of other ways um so yeah i'm now really interested in in that as well again that can be used to um, control other instruments as well as the internal synth but the internal synth sounds fine actually and i could see that being used in performances because you can get quite athletic with it um, because it's all locked to a particular scale uh, just down from where the wiggler was there was also the embod me i think it's pronounced the um array um which is a sort of squidgy uh, touch controller and I'm always really really skeptical of squidgy touch controllers because I really hated using the rolly keys just couldn't get on with it um, but this um, is kind of different the first thing that's different is that I thought it was going to be rubbery but it's actually got a cloth over the top which makes it really smooth to play it's very responsive um, and uh, what's more interesting to me is that it's extremely configurable. You can basically lay out the, the pads any way that you want. You can have faders and XY things and drum pads and keyboards and lots of other things. And you can then also program things with a, an API apparently. Uh, but really excitingly, it has 24 CV outputs that can either be CV or gate which is mad. So this could genuinely be the ultimate control surface for a modular system, even a very big modular system. I think they're also adding sequences to it as well. So it could be um, sort of crazy good for that sort of world if you want to get hands on um, control of your modular. And again, uh, and not that expensive for, for what it is, I don't think. So uh, that's maybe one to uh, check out. While we're talking about control surfaces, I quite like these Intex Studio Grid, these sort of modular clip together control surfaces where you can have buttons and knobs and faders. Uh, they all get powered off the 
first one in the chain. Uh, you, they all get sent out over USB via the first one in the chain. And then they're very, very open in terms of how you can have them set up. There's a whole uh, sort of definition language that you can use so that you can define what every slider, knob, button does in granular detail and have it work for your particular setup. The one uh, thing that was kind of a bit of a shame, I think, was that it was only USB MIDI. You didn't have like an actual MIDI output, so you would have to use a MIDI host. But as it happens, they sell a very small uh, neat MIDI host, so you know they do at least cater for that as well. And finally, um, if you're into utility and you're doing a lot of stuff with MIDI, especially live MIDI, a company called Audio Verkstatt um, was showing off a bunch of useful MIDI utility boxes for doing one job really, really well. Most of it was around clocking and sort of resynchronizing clock um, between um, different devices, even if you unplug and plug stuff back in. And I could see if you are sort of doing performances that are live and making use of a lot of MIDI, these might be the thing which tie everything together. So it's probably worth checking out what they have available. He showed me lots of um, ways that performances can go wrong and how with a, a single button press, you can make them go right again with his um, bits and bobs. So yeah, check those out if that is your sort of world. So I think that's everything that I wanted to talk about. If I haven't spoken about something, it's not because I didn't like it. Uh, it's more likely that I just didn't see it or didn't take video of it and therefore have already forgotten about it. There's a lot at Superbooth. I was there for two days and you could definitely fill three days with so much stuff going on, especially with all the performances as well as all of the, the lovely gear and just the vibes and hanging out with people, uh, which I did also spend quite a lot of time just hanging out with people, uh, which is also um, uh, really nice because it turns out synth nerds tend to be nice people. So that's good to know. Hopefully some of the more obscure stuff from smaller makers I'm going to try and get on the channel over the next few months because that's kind of what I'm passionate about showing off. Um, so keep an eye out on the channel for that and make sure you're subscribed if you haven't already and make sure you like this video if you enjoyed this little rundown. Um, I think that's everything. My brain is fried from Super Booth. Um, I may never recover. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot in a good way, but it is a lot. Um, so I guess until next time, take care. Bye-bye.